extraordinarily rare that I'm allowing cameras in the Bonazian. American history. Every screw, nut, bolt, capacitor, tube, speaker. This light switch looks like it's from China, but, but I got that with the house. Welcome, kids. Welcome to Nerdville. I had a moment when I bought this house because it came with a console. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do a studio, maybe, you know, because the console's already there, because that's, you would figure that's the most amount of money. And, but there was no preamps, there was no patch bays, there was no any of that stuff. And a couple of my friends, they started using terms like black hole and, you know, the gift that keeps on charging, you know. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn this room into to a soundproof nerd sanctuary where I can come out here and wind up a deluxe reverb and watch, you know, American Pickers and, and Simpsons marathons till I'm either passed out or sick of it. My father was a vintage guitar dealer, so I grew up kind of in a guitar shop. I grew up on Guitar Safari. We would answer strip ads. They used to call this thing called the, in upstate New York called the Swap Sheet. And it would be like Gibson B25 Acoustic, $250. You call them, hey, got anything else? Yeah, I got a few amps. You want to come over? Well, it's an hour and a half away, sure. And we would drive all the way out an hour and a half to buy a, a really crappy, probably cracked B25 Gibson acoustic just because you never knew what else somebody else was holding and offer enough money to where everybody would win. And we'd always make it the offer loud enough so the, the guy's wife would hear it because the allure of the new kitchen remodel was so great and the pressure from that would always make the deal happen. I'd seen it like a million times. You go, we could buy new cabinets. Why don't you sell that dusty thing that's been sitting in the garage? You know, great. Got a blackface showman out of the deal, you know? <laughs> this guitar was bought on Guitar Safari, New Orleans, about three years ago. It was in Algiers Point. Now this is where Steven Seagal, my friend, the actor, um, films that cop show. And the driver, I was like, we gotta go to Algiers Point guitar shop. And he's like, dude, we're not going to Algiers Point for anything, you know? He goes, you sure? I go, I guess it's the middle of the day, what can happen? Guitar safari, we come in peace. Mike goes poking around. And all of a sudden this guy comes out and says, yeah, this is the guitar shop, come on back. We're going to this guy's garage. And he goes, I got a gold top, you wanna see it? I'm like, sure. He pulls this thing out. I'm like, oh man, fun. Late 55, so it's the first, one of the first two pneumatic bridges. He bought it from the original owner who played it on Decatur Street and all in New Orleans for its whole life. And when you see this kind of patina on a gold top, that's the South. That's high humidity, high heat, a lot of sweaty bars. And I just love the story. I walked out with it and I immediately, I just was like, I got it back to the hotel and I was like, I'm looking at it, I'm like, I'm, what am I gonna call this thing? Because I don't name them all, but I name some of them. I wanna just, just go, this is the Cajun. It's just, how cool is that? You know, a beat up gold top, you know? Yeah. This is the very first black Strat ever made. Um, Howard worked at McCord's Music, which was the biggest Fender dealer in the Midwest, and McCord's ordered it in um, summer of 55, and he got it around November of 55. I had a poster of this in my wall when I was 11 years old, and I just longed after this guitar. I just, I just thought it was the coolest black with all that patina. The late uh, Bill Blackburn, who just passed away, um, decided to sell this guitar. Um, it had spent uh, 17 years in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because Howard Reed, after Cliff Gallup left Gene Vincent in the Blue Caps, replaced Cliff Gallup. So this guitar is very historical as far as a, the history, you know, rock and roll history, and more historical as 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 how many black strats have you seen? Millions. This is the earliest known black Fender strat. I first started playing professionally around age 11. You know, we get paid 
for the gigs. And yeah, I'd make $300, $500. And for an 11 year old, that's, man, I was Mr. Burns, okay? I was like, I was, I, I was loaded. Especially a school lunch was a dollar. So I just sock it away and my father would do these guitar shows and I'd have a little stash and I'd go buy a Tweed, um, you know, Deluxe. Because I never, I wanted a Tweed Deluxe. Didn't know what I was looking at and probably got taken for a ride. But this is back on the day when a Tweed Deluxe was $500, $650 if it was clean. It had to be, God. And my father would yell, you overpaid. A rosewood neck Stratocaster with a sunburst finish was $2,500. A refinish would be about $1,250 to $1,500. What gets me now is when they still use the same term, player. It's in player's condition. You know, 1964 Strat, player condition. Issues, routed, blah, 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 blah. $10,000. Like, what, what working musician can spend $10,000 on a guitar that's not right? You know, it's like, you know, back in when I was coming up, it was, it was, more obtainable and you had the opportunity as a, as a budding collector without going into the poorhouse for, you know, to, to really try all this stuff and figure out what worked for you and what, what didn't. And I figured out a long time ago that if you had a Desert Island, a Gibson guitar and a Fender amp, that was the magic combination for me. Because it, because it would always, you know, it just, it just sounded like B.B. King. Especially if you dime the reverb, and I'm too lazy to go turn it down, so, so sue me. None of this is legally binding. <laughs> this is one of the rarest Fender guitars that I own. It's so strange. For as many sunburst strats as Leo made in the 50s, he made a handful of tellies in 55 and in 58. These sunburst finishes in the 50s over ash, they sunk into the grain lines, and that's something you can't fake. So when this thing came out of the case, I was like, oh yeah, I'm in, easy enough. And um, still stock with the... I'm a firm believer, like this guitar came from the original owner to me, I'm the second guy who's owned this guitar. Ask me how many times this guitar has been apart. Zero. Why? I don't care what the fucking neck date is. I don't care what the pot codes are, what week of 58. I know it's a 58, two reasons. Why? Because the neck shape kind of dictates it. The serial number is pretty close. It starts with a two. And the logo's changed in 58 and the finish on the necks have this kind of crazing that's intrinsic to 58. That's all I know. And the guy said he bought it in 58. I don't need pictures of the cavity, of the browning, because would you want to be unscrewed 50 million times for a photo op? No. You know, I hate when people pop the neck for no reason. What, what's the neck there? I had to know. No, you didn't. If you don't know, don't buy it. If you're unsure, don't buy it. If you think you're gonna flip it and make some money, really don't buy it. So you have to enter into that deal knowing that one day your prized possession that you think is worth all this money could be worth nothing. And then you have to ask yourself the question, do you still love it? And in my case, absolutely. I'd rather have this than anything else. Hi, my name is Joe and I'm a guitar addict. And this is what happens when addiction coupled with a monicum of success in the music business meets and there's no authority figure to say no and please stop. Very underrated amplifier, the D Armin RT5. It's basically a, a Tweed Harvard killer, overwound transformers, really mint EH150, found in Pennsylvania. By the way, none of this stuff is eBay. 
Okay, so if you're an eBayer, you don't have to worry about me because I'm not dealing with people that, that post under assumed names like Mr. Shades. I'm pretty proud of the Tweet Amp collection. In all of these lies the mint set. Narrow panel, 58 through 60, 57 through 60, because we have to count the low power twin. You have Champ, Princeton, Harvard, Vibralux, Deluxe, Super, Tremolex, Bandmaster, low power twin, Baseman, high power twin. All in mint condition, I can, I can deliver you a mint set out of the catalog, and there's multiples of each. This took me years with a Y to, to put this all together, and to, mint tweed stuff is so difficult to find. The amps would go out of the shop, if they'd sit around the shop for a year, they'd go out of the shop looking beat up, because they just, they just wore out. So to find it all in this kind of condition is pretty rare. This is a 1945 K&F um, Kaufman, Doc Kaufman in Leo uh, Fender amplifier. This is a 1946 K&F Woody, one of the earliest known ones, bottom mount chassis. And I found this, this was a barn find in Ohio, and I brought it to my, my amp tech. Uh, and he, he pulled it apart for the first time, and he looks at it, and he looks at me, and he's a big Leo Fender fan as well, and he goes, Joe, I, I gotta tell you, I think most likely Leo wired this amp. And I said, you know what? I can't prove that Leo wired this amp, but it looks like pretty crude work, and it's not gonna sound that great anyway. So it's history, you know what I mean? And then this is a 47 Fender Woody. He broke away from Doc Hoffman. And look at how primitive that Jensen speaker is. I would have I would have had a 1948 dual professional to show you, but I blew that up upon plugging it in. So that's at the shop. The thing about collecting is you don't have to keep up with the Joneses. You know, you don't have to have one of everything just because they tell you. I like Fender and Gibson, so that's why that's what I buy. And you know, there's plenty of other Marshalls and plenty of Voxes for everybody else. I I you know, just just stay out of my way when I want to tweet him. I took my friend Kirk Fletcher, who was out on the Three Kings tour with me, and I said, you want to go guitar safari with me? I got, we're going to go to one shop only. Kirk, been my friend for a long time, but he never seen me out in the wild when the storm is about to rage. And I, and I, we're in the car, we're going over to this guitar shop, and I said, I said, I said, Kirk, just, just so you understand, what we're about to get into, a little bit of a hostile negotiation, and I go, what, you, what you're going to see here is going to be fast and furious, and you're going to go, what the hell? Check? Check. I come in, of course, there's nobody else in this store. How you been, you know, get, 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 a, you know, get the formalities out of the way. And I go, hey, still got that Seafoam Jazzmaster. Yeah, can I see it? He came to the price in about three minutes. I shook his hand. And I see, see my friend Kirk going, what? Put the case aside. I said, um, you still got that Pelham Blue EBOF? $6,500 for the base. Free Zvex. Shook his hand. Put the case aside. You still got that Fiesta Red 62 Jaguar? shake his hand. I go, nice to see you again. We walked out. Three guitars in about seven minutes. And he was like, what, what did you just buy? I go, guitar so far. What not to do to a 51 no caster? Put humbucker in it. But once it's done, now we're having some fun, you know, because it's like, it's a great combination, ash body and the humbucker and the, the flat pole. 61 first year, just the year before the Keith Richards one. Keith Richards one was block frets, so I think it's probably 63, this is 61. 64, 335, why? Because Clapton played one. 57 gold top, that's pretty nice. That's really nice condition. That's a GA83S, and it has a single 12 and two eights on each side. It's a stereo amp. That's an EH150, matching set and the radio and stage cases, the amp. That was the guy's whole kit. That was his life in music. 
that came from Vermont. This is the, the, the brown stuff, the, the chocolate covered amps, a couple of vibra verbs, pretty rare. I like the reverb tanks. This is a very unique circuit. It's an 80 watt amp. Loud and clean was the goal. So he achieved that goal with these amps. The only problem is when you turn them up to like nine, they're still clean and they're loud, but they're just super, super clean. And they only made about 500 of them. This was gonna be my transition from Marshalls to Fenders. I thought three white twins would be really cool, but it just sonically didn't work. So now they're here. That's a 20 watt lead and bass. It's a like a 71, really mint. You turn everything up to 10. I'm like, if you need to get your blues breakers on, that's, that's the way to do it. All my Marshalls, I know exactly where they came from. Because I pulled all of those, at least the bottom stacks, from the original owners. Two mint matching stacks and a mint park stack that I pull out of Marseille, France. And I wheeled it down a cobblestone road with Mike. And that's enough Marshall fun for a lifetime. Our friend Rick Nielsen, who I kind of nicked the whole idea of playing authentic vintage guitars on the road from him because it was always so nice to see a Carina Explorer or a, or a Sunburst Les Paul or just a bevy of, and, and, and Tom had Rickenbacker Transonics and Robin had Black Artelli, you know, and, and they were on the road. They were working musicians on the road, so why? So I know Rick Nielsen's into uh, Skylark lap steels, and so am I, so um, let's, let's have a bidding war, shall we? Um, as far as guitar-wise, I either love them mint or I love the turds. This is a 66. That black spot on the pickguard isn't a sticker. That would be the second layer of the pickguard because the dude wore through the first. When I got this, not only were the frets worn out, there were huge divots through each string, through the fret, into the wood. So this guitar almost has a, a self-scallop. And I bought this guitar because I said, if something this loved for so long, it had to be good. And I plugged it in and it rings. It just, it just howls, you know? And it's a, and I'm a huge Bonnie Ray fan, so this is my, my Bonnie caster. I've owned this the longest. I bought this when I was a kid. I was 14 years old, saved up all my money, and it was mint when I got it. And I played it throughout my early career, I took it on the road. Even this, that, that, that ill-advised time when I was like, you know, young and, and had a studded belt and I thought it was really, really cool. I just figured it out. After putting this big mark in the guitar, and look at myself in the mirror on a daily basis that I'll never be cool. This is Carmelita, AKA the claw. You see that? Those three kind of chevrons? Looks like a claw. That's why they call it the claw. And the guitar ended up in Hawaii in the early 80s and was sold uh, to, eventually went to a friend of mine in Missouri, and then it went to a friend of mine um, here in California. And, and uh, Carmelita's in a bunch of books, and it's in the Beauty of the Burst. And, um, and the thing about Carmelita in this serial number range, I own three in this serial, serial number range. I own 1948, 1951, which is the Skinner Burst, and then 1953, which is Carmelita. It's not the year, it's just, it's just the serial number after the nine. Mm -hmm. And um, they all intrinsically have the same kind of neck, which tells you they were built in batches. And a friend of mine has 1945, which is basically, there's two piece top, right? His top matches the, the, the bottom of this, and then the bottom of this matches, you know? So it was basically the same piece of wood that was used to make them. And we, we actually took pictures of it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> smooths out the blackface. The old blues guys, you know, they, they would crank the reverb. That's the Blake Bloomfield thing, you know? This guitar will end the uh, show and tell day. This guitar is known as Amos. 
I named this guitar because of this guy. Here's Amos Arthur, owner of Arthur's Music in Indianapolis in 1958, holding this very modernistic wedge-shaped guitar. He has the look on his face going, why in the hell did Gibson send me this thing I'll never be able to sell to anybody? You can barely sit down and play it. Here's Amos, the guitar, on the stand in the shop, 1958. Here is Kenny C., their guitar instructor, on the roof of a convenience store during a pole sitting competition. It was like a record setting event. Like this woman up here in the photo, she's sitting in a, like a box, like 100 feet off the ground. And I bought this guitar from Norm Harris, Norm's Rare Guitars. And Norman was, was very kind to sell this to me because he'd owned it for 40 years. He knew I wanted a real V and I'd only go to him because I knew if he'd sold me a V, it was real. And I didn't have to do the, is it real, is it not real? And then to, to unearth all this documentation was even better. I decided that I think one of the best guitar safaris you could ever do is to take, especially when the music store is still open and it's run by the granddaughter and the daughter of, of Amos Arthur. Last year, Rick, Mike, and myself, discreetly, it wasn't for publicity or anything else, it was just for pure guitar geekdom and, and for the love of this kind of thing and for the love of a mom and pop shop that has been open since 1952, which is very rare. And we took it back and we took the case back, and that guitar had not seen that store and hadn't seen those people in almost, I don't know, 57 years. I, it was just the greatest day to just put the guitar on the, you know, on, the, on the counter and watch them look at it. And it was a direct link to their grandfather and their father. And that's what it was all about. So they had this rickety ladder, and we're dragging this very valuable guitar up the rickety ladder, and I'm on the roof of the store. And um, I recreated the shot, and I got pictures with everybody, and, and this truss rod cover. They were nice enough to uh, loan me their father's good one off, the, off um, his personal guitar. It was an L7. A friend of mine found a blank from the 50s. It's one of these fancy things they would sell aftermarket in the music stores, and we had it engraved, Amos Arthur, in tribute to him. So the idea of this thing is not to look at it and go, wow, it's a very rare wedge-shaped guitar. The idea is to play music with it, and I play it every night. Oh, he was in Spinal Tap. Norman loaned all the, his guitars for the movie. And in the movie, you could see it sitting on the stand, so this guitar was in Spinal Tap. So thanks to Norm and thanks to the people at Arthur's Music because ultimately it is a very special guitar with a very special story. I, I can't top this. After, after all this stuff today, I can't top this. If nobody knew me as a collector and I just used endorsement stuff and, you know, I just sat here up in my little, my little, my little hovel, you know, going, haha, look what I got. It, it, to who? Nobody's here. You know, it's like, I mean, my whole idea is, is to share. And, you know, some people take it the wrong way. It's like, I'm flaunting, I'm not flaunting, I'm just sharing it. It's all about sharing the information and keeping this thing somewhat honest. When it comes down to just assessing where you are as a musician, are you proud of that? Just because you own a guitar or you own a bass, are you proud of the work you, you did as a musician to become the musician that you became? Ultimately, we can throw all this stuff away, and I'm still proud of the work, the 35 years of work that I put in to become the musician that I am. And whether you like the way I play or you don't, it still took 35 years of hard work and practice to, to sustain a career, come up with this dog and pony show and ultimately um, you know learn how to learn the instrument and try to get as much as you can out of it you know and to me that's 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 what it's about and and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm right or wrong it's just my opinion and and the hipster kids don't care about me and they shouldn't care what I think but I'm watching oh I'm watching <laughs> Thank you.